Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm going to be a wee bit cheeky here. My name's Michael Barnett, Chief Executive of the Auckland Chamber of Commerce. I've done this before, but each year into Auckland and out at Hobsonville, about 700 young kids come and they're between the ages of 18 and 24. And these kids, to a lot of people and in a lot of areas, a lot of communities, would be socially unacceptable. They're probably on their last chance, but they've chosen to take a chance. And what they're doing is they're going to participate in a program which is limited service volunteers. And this is a project of the Prime Minister's and it's one that the Chamber works with the Ministry of Social Development on. So 700 young kids, they go in for six weeks. And when they come in, they've got the hoodies on and the phones hooked to their ears and their eyes pinned to the ground. And when they come out, they're standing up and they're looking you fair square in the eye and they are ready to work. They're at the most employable stage of their lives. They're ready to participate in society. And each year, the Auckland City Council, for example, takes, well, last year they took over 150 of these kids. They gave them work experience and that provided a platform for these young kids to restart their lives, to be able to participate in their communities. If you're sitting there and there's a single possibility that you could provide me with a work experience or provide an opportunity for the employment for these young kids, I'd really appreciate it if you could make contact with me today or even after today's event. It's a worthwhile thing to do. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce the Prime Minister, Right Honourable John Key. Prime Minister, your business audience today represents enterprises that generate wealth, employment and wages for this region. They have a genuine interest in what you have to say. They appreciate that business in Auckland generates 38% of the nation's productivity. We are New Zealand's only city and economy of scale. For some time, the Chamber has been concerned that we are not moving as quickly as we could and should in taking decisions that need to be made on Auckland's big issues. For businesses to thrive, there is a need for certainty. Unquestionably, the excitement around yesterday's City Rail Link is the signal it sends that government is willing to invest in Auckland. This is not interfering in Auckland affairs. It is acknowledging that Auckland's dominant contribution to New Zealand is critical and must be encouraged and secured. Michael, thanks very much. Can I just acknowledge you and the Auckland Chamber of Commerce and thank you for uh, the sterling work actually you do representing uh, business interests here in Auckland and uh, for organising today's lunch. Can I acknowledge uh, the Minister of Transport, uh, Jerry Brownlee. Uh, Jerry and I were in Christchurch yesterday with him wearing his other hat uh, in relation to the rebuild of uh, Christchurch, which you'll be aware is a massive event, basically uh, $40 billion being spent in that city as we rebuild and yesterday the government announcing that uh, there'll be another $4.8 billion being spent of which um, our, our share was $2.9 billion so it's uh, certainly quite a week for spending some money. So I want to talk about some of the issues that are facing Auckland. Uh, Auckland is not just New Zealand's biggest city, it is not just the home of one third of New Zealand's population is not just uh, New Zealand's largest commercial capital and is not just uh, the primary gateway to New Zealand. Auckland is all of these things, but most of all, this city is more than any other in New Zealand, the place that links our country to the rest of the world. Auckland is our international face. Auckland is a city where we line up against the other great Pacific Rim cities. In a country that is totally dependent on international links to succeed, Auckland is our premier shop window. And its ethnic makeup, a unique fusion of Māori, European, Asian and Pacifica cultures, 
is an asset to New Zealand. My government is very focused on making Auckland a success, not just for Aucklanders, but indeed for all New Zealanders. It's crucial for every New Zealander that Auckland succeeds. Like every other city in the world, Auckland is growing and will continue to grow. Auckland is very important, but it's not separate from the rest of New Zealand. Most of the issues the government deals with involve Auckland and every other region of New Zealand. We are a government for all New Zealand, and Auckland is a third of our country. Decisions we make invariably affect people and businesses in Auckland. A third of the government's budget is spent on Auckland in the areas like health and education, housing, law and order, and all forms of transport. So it's very hard to break these things down with great accuracy, but we estimate the government is spending around about $24 billion in Auckland this year alone. And what happens in Auckland affects the rest of New Zealand. So today I want to take this opportunity to talk about some issues that are important to Auckland, and because of that, are important to the rest of the country as well. We are backing Auckland to succeed in many ways. One of those is by negotiating initiatives that contribute to jobs and growth through our business growth agenda. The business growth agenda is about providing Auckland businesses with the things that they need to be successful. It's about providing better market access, better access to capital and resources, better public infrastructure, and access to innovation and skilled people. Through the BGA, we are greatly increasing the number of tertiary places in the city, and in particular in South Auckland. We are supporting innovative firms through the Callaghan Innovation, which has a significant and growing presence here in the city. We are rolling out ultra-fast broadband across the city and the country to connect our smart, high-tech, creative IT companies to the world. And we are providing a world-class international convention centre to attract conferences from overseas. We are currently finalising arrangements with Sky City to build a $400 million convention centre, which will cater for 3,500 delegates at any one time. Each year, the convention centre is expected to attract around about 33,000 new convention uh, conference delegates, uh, projected $90 million a year into the economy. Estimates are that 1,000 jobs will be created during construction and 800 once it's up and running. The increase in gaming machines that is part of the steal will happen within the context of a sinking lid policy. Yes, there will be more gaming machines within Sky City, but there will be fewer in total across Auckland and across New Zealand. There are other ways in which the government is backing Auckland, for example, through speeding up the Auckland unitary plan process. The first point I want to make is that overall, the reorganisation of local government in Auckland has gone well. There is a single voice advocating for Auckland. It has allowed a city-wide view to be taken, and the larger combined council means there is more grunt to get things done. I know that there has been a lot of debate about some provisions in the draft unitary plan, particularly around the intensification of development. Those are matters for Aucklanders to determine. The government is playing its role by setting the overall framework under which the plan is finalised, how people and communities can have a proper say in developing the plan and how quickly that can be done. It was clear right from the start that if we hadn't done anything special for Auckland in this process, it would have taken seven to ten years for the plan to fully come into effect, with a lot of time and money spent arguing in the Environment Court. That, in our view, was far too long. On the other hand, some wanted a very truncated process with the unitary plan having immediate legal effect. We didn't agree with that either because it wouldn't let people and communities have their say. So we've taken a balanced approach, which is a one-off streamlined process by which the plan will come into effect in around about three years, uh, but where Aucklanders can still contribute and have a proper say. Special legislation is currently before Parliament to do this, and it will be passed very soon. 
On the housing front, the government has two major concerns, housing affordability and the provision of state housing. The affordability of housing is of a particular issue here in Auckland, and I know a lot of people worry about the next generation and that they will not be able to afford to buy their own home. But housing can be made more affordable in Auckland and across the country by focusing on the key areas that actually make a difference. These are land supply, consent processes, provision of infrastructure, and productivity in the construction sector. The government is working with councils, and in particular with the Auckland Council, on these issues because the decisions uh, they make about housing affect the entire economy. Rapidly rising house prices, for example, could force the Reserve Bank to raise interest rates which affects every mortgage holder and every business in the country and in turn would put pressure on the exchange rate which affects every exporter in New Zealand. As part of our budget, we introduced legislation to speed up the provision of new housing in areas where the pressure is greatest and housing is least affordable. Special housing areas will be designated under accords between the government and councils. Council approvals for new housing in those areas can then be managed under a streamlined process. The first of these accords has been agreed with Auckland Council leadership and will be going to the Council for ratification. It sets a target of 39,000 new residential houses to be consented in Auckland over the next three years. To put a bit of perspective around that, that is a huge increase on the average 3,600 homes that have been consented over each of the past four years and the 7,400 on average that have been consented over the past 20 years. In terms of state housing, we inherited a situation where a lot of state houses were in the wrong part of the country and the wrong size. Many were of poor quality and many people couldn't get housing assistance when they really needed it. So we've set about to try and fix that problem as well. By the end of this year, for example, every state house that can be insulated will be insulated. Before the budget, we announced two big projects. One is to add up to 3,000 new state house bedrooms to 2,000 existing properties over the next two years, with three quarters of them uh, built in Auckland. The other is to build another 500 two-bedroom state houses in Auckland to address the big demand for such housing in the city. The government is also extending reviewable tenancies to all state housing tenants. This means people can be in social housing when they have high needs and for as long as those needs persist. But they will be given opportunity and support to move into alternative housing when their situation improves and they are in a position to take that step to independence. This will free up houses for other people and other families with high needs who would otherwise be shut out of social housing. I want to now turn, if I may, to transport. Auckland needs a cohesive, efficient transport system combining road, rail and other public transport to meet the needs of its growing population and to improve its contribution to the nation's economic growth. The government has been spending more than ever before on building this city's transport network. Currently we are investing around about a billion dollars a year. That includes funding for state highways, local roads, rail and other public transport subsidies. Aucklanders will see the culmination of much of this investment within the next four years. For the first time in the city's history, it will have a fully joined up motorway network and modern new electric trains running on an upgraded electrified rail network. We have already completed the Victoria Park Tunnel and replaced the Newmarket Viaduct. Work is well underway on the Waterview Connection which is New Zealand's biggest road project ever, with a construction bill of a touch over 1.4 billion. This will complete the Western Ring Route, providing a continuous motorway route from Manukau to Albany as an alternative to State Highway 1. The Waterview connection will also create a continuous motorway link between the CBD and the airport. 
In addition, the Waterview connection and associated work already taking place or starting on the northwestern motorway will give better connections between the important West Auckland area of the city and the rest of Auckland. We are also focused on improving connections between Auckland and its neighbouring regions. Work is well underway on the Waikato Expressway, which will substantially reduce travel times between Auckland and Waikato, improve growth, productivity and also improve safety. By the end of this year, half of the 10 sections of the expressway will have been completed and the whole project is scheduled to be completed by 2019. Looking to, nor to the north, the Puhoi to Wellsford project will significantly improve access between Auckland and Northland. Our political opponents call this project the Holiday Highway, but as you all know, this is absolute nonsense. The Puhoi to Wellsford project will effectively shrink the distance between these regions and provide a major boost to Northland's economic growth prospects. At the end of this project, and together with the Waikato Expressway, there will be a high quality, high capacity highway stretching from Cambridge in the south to Wellsford in the north. But transport is not just about roads. The government is also investing $1.6 billion to upgrade and electrify the rail network and to assist Auckland Council to buy new electric trains. This is the biggest single development in New Zealand's rail network in decades and involves duplication of the entire Western Line, including construction of a $140 million rail trench through New Lynn, building a spur line to Monaco and electrifying the Auckland network. By April next year, new electric trains will be running on the electrified network all 57 trains on order are expected to be in service by 2016. This will complete a step change improvement in Auckland's rail network and provide reliable services at 10 minute frequencies in the morning and evening peak periods. These improvements to the state highway and rail networks together with increased funding for public transport will make a real difference for Aucklanders going about their daily lives for Auckland business and for anyone who visits or does business with Auckland. However, now is not the time to stand still. Although conditions will improve as a result of increased investment, the state highway network will come under further pressure as Auckland grows. The New Zealand Transport Agency has some projects on its books that would address congestion, capitalise on the benefits of the Western Ring Route and improve access to the airport. These include uh, projects to deliver a complete motorway to motorway link between the Upper Har Harbour Highway and the North Northern Motorway at Constellation Drive, upgrade the Gravel Road interchange and improve the Northern Busway. They include widening the southern motorway between Manukau and Papakura and to reduce delays on the final State Highway 2080 link to the airport from the north by upgrading it to a motorway standard. Under current funding assumptions, construction of these uh, three projects may be up to 10 years away before they even start, but the government is not prepared to wait that long. So Transport Minister Jerry Brownlee has asked the Transport Agency for advice on how to bring forward the construction and start dates for these projects. And we will be providing additional funding to enable this all to happen. While the projects I mentioned are very important, there are three other major projects that are going to be required as well. These are the next generation of major projects to further develop and improve transport in Auckland for the benefit of the city and the country. The Council's Auckland plan includes an ambitious transport programme which places the highest priority on three projects. These include the combined auckland Monaco Eastern Transport Initiative, Amity, and the East West Link, the second Waitemata Harbour Crossing, and the City Rail Link. These three projects have a price tag of around about $10 billion, and they are projects that are needed to be planned for over a long period of time. So I want to talk about each of these in turn. The first is the Auckland Manukau Eastern Transport Initiative and East West Link. As you know, the area between Onihunga, Mount Wellington and East Tamaki 
is home to a number of industrial and logistics businesses that make a critical contribution to the Auckland and national economy. About as many people are employed here as in the CBD, and there is considerable potential for more growth. However, the transport links in and out of this area aren't up to the job. Truck drivers have told us that they can get stuck in congestion at any time during the working day, and a seven minute trip between the metro port and Onehunga Wharf can take as long as 40 minutes. There are two major projects proposed in this area. The first is the $1.5 billion Auckland to Manukau Eastern Transport Initiative, Amity. The first phase of this is underway, but the project as a whole will not be complete for another 20 years. The second project is the proposed east-west link between the southern and southwestern motorways. In combination with Amity, the east-west link will improve connections to the state highway network, primarily along the Nielsen Street corridor, and upgrade the links connecting to the eastern suburbs and East Tamaki industrial area. Improvements to public trans uh, transport infrastructure are also likely to be included in the East-West Link project. The Transport Agency and Auckland Transport are working together on the initial options for the project. What I can tell you is that resolving the transport problems in this part of Auckland is the government's next major focus for the Auckland Transport Network. Given the economic importance of the area, delivering these projects over uh, 20 years is simply not acceptable. We have therefore asked the Transport Agency to tell us which elements of Amity and the East-West Link can be accelerated with additional funding and how that funding can best be targeted across both projects. The second next generation transport project is another harbour crossing. The Auckland Harbour Bridge is one of the most critical transport links in the country, but forecasts indicate it won't be long before demand exceeds the bridge's capacity. Despite recent strengthening, limits on the weight loading capacity on the clip-ons means that heavy uh, truck access may need to be increasingly managed from around about 2021. Congestion on the bridge is already a problem in peak periods. Traffic forecasts indicate that as Auckland's economy grows, this will increasingly spread across the working day. So a new harbour crossing is likely to be needed between 2025 and 2030. A new harbour crossing will address the issues I've just mentioned and provide for expected growth in Auckland's population and economy. The government agrees with the Auckland Council that the next crossing should be a tunnel. The first step in what will be a very long-term project is therefore to protect the route for the crossing, which we expect will occur before the end of the year, once the details of the preferred alignment have been confirmed. Lastly, we come to the City Rail Link. The Auckland Central Business District is New Zealand's main commercial and financial centre, and as it grows, its important transport links into the city can continue to meet demand. So over the past decade, there has been a massive amount of government and council investment in transport projects to improve access to the CBD. However, it's clear that supporting growth in Auckland CBD will require more resources into the future. Last year, Auckland's Transport um, City Centre Future Access Study concluded that the forecast growth and demand for access to the city centre would best be met with a combination of proposed city rail link and substantial access upgrades for buses. I can tell you that the government broadly agrees with that conclusion. We don't, however, agree with this, the timeframes proposed in the report, which conclude that the City Rail Link need to be in place by 2021. Given the scale of the project, this would mean effectively starting construction in two years' time. So I've indicated earlier this week that the government is commi committing to a joint business plan for the City Rail Link with Auckland Council in 2017 and providing our share of the funding for a construction start date of 2020. We will be prepared to consider an earlier start date if it becomes clear that Auckland CBD employment and rail patronage growth hits thresholds faster than current rates of growth uh, that is suggested. Our current thinking is that an earlier business plan could be triggered if two conditions are met. 
The first is if Auckland City Centre employment increases by 25% over current levels. That is half the increase predicted in the future access study. And the second is that annual rail patronage is on track to hit 20 million trips well before 2020. But these things are, some, are, uh, are matters that we can discuss with the Auckland Council. We will also need to address funding, including how project costs will be shared between the government and the council. Uh, in the meantime, the conclusions of the future access study showed business uh, crowding and congestion coming into the CBD is a priority issue, and we will look to make funding available uh, in the next government uh, transport policy statement for projects like this to address. In conclusion, I want to return to what I started talking about today, and that is how the government is backing Auckland to succeed. I want to see a vibrant, successful, international Auckland, one that its residents are proud to call home, and one that provides for their needs and aspirations. Crucial infrastructure is vital to the city's future and its inhabitants. The government's direction is crystal clear. We want to accelerate vitally needed projects and get on with the job. There is no doubt that Auckland is going to continue to grow and we have to be ahead of the curve in addressing the city's crucial infrastructure needs. So what is clear from what we have announced today is that as well as accelerating the projects uh, and looking for answers to those particular ones of those three crucial projects uh, that are probably next generation, they include about $11 billion worth of expenditure. The government will have to work with Auckland Council uh, but, and uh, with our own officials to work out how we intend to pay for all of these matters but I can say they're likely to come from a combination of uh, the future investment fund, the proceeds of the mixed ownership model, they'll come from the National Transport uh, Land Transport Fund, they'll come from the government making its own appropriations out of uh, general expenditure, and they may come from doing uh, deals with the private sector in terms of PPPs. All of these can contribute towards uh, the uh, cost of the 11 plus billion dollars. What is clear is Auckland can't wait 20 years for these projects to be started or be completed. If we want to be the home of uh, a growing population where people can have a high quality of life, get about their, their business and enjoy a quality of life, we need an infrastructure that will allow the city to grow and therefore allow New Zealand to grow. This government is very focused on building the infrastructure from ultra-fast broadband to roading to public transport to ensure that will happen and uh, we intend to get on and get the job done. Thank you very much. Prime Minister, you've certainly put on record today your government's intent, and I'm sure that the people in this room appreciate that. When I introduced you, I spoke of certainty, and I think today you've added to the certainty that we can look at as we move forward. But I think today, was not just about one project. I think the language has changed. The language is about a completed network. So it is about Amity and East West, it is about the rail loop, and it is about a third crossing. I think some of the other projects that you've touched on that will make a difference in Auckland, including the Innovation Centre, Housing, the Conference Centre, all of these will make a difference. And as I said when I introduced you, this is not interfering in Auckland, but acknowledging the important role of Auckland and the willingness of central government to invest here. I did detect some conditionality in your offer of assistance for Auckland today, but I really do believe that it's up to business and it's up to Auckland's leadership to accelerate what's been put in place today for the good of Auckland and for the good of New Zealand. Ladies and gentlemen, please join with me in thanking the Prime Minister for his address today.